Opening the case for opposition, we have Natasha Hausdorff. Ms. Natasha Hausdorff is a barrister at Sinks Pub Court Chambers, a frequent speaker on international law and a commentator on the Arab-Israeli conflict. She clerked for the late Chief Justice Miriam Noor, President of Israel Supreme Court, and was a fellow at Columbia's Law School's National Security Law Program. Natasha read law at Oxford University, qualified as a solicitor at Skadden, and subsequently gained an LLM from the Tel Aviv University, specializing in public international law. Ms. Natasha Hausdorff, you have the ears of the house. Mr. President, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to set the record straight because we've already heard a plethora of misinformation. I'm going to address the heart of this conflict. I'm going to lay down some law, given the misrepresentations we've already heard on occupation, and I'm going to be talking about learning from history. At the heart of this conflict is a racist refusal to accept the Jews' right of self-determination in their ancient homeland as an indigenous population. That is what the nation state law, the basic law, was talking about, and it didn't change anything about the uh, legal framework or the status of citizens in Israel. It was a declaratory law on exactly that issue. But long before the establishment, or I should say the re-establishment of the Jewish state, Arabs have been killing Jews because they are Jews. From the Tzfat Massacre of 1834 to the Hebron Massacre of 1929 to the continuous wars of attempted annihilation against Israel to the multitude of terror attacks against Israeli civilians to the recent murder of Lucy, Rina and Maya D. May their memories be a blessing. Gunned down in cold blood by Palestinian terrorists. Arab aggression has cost tens of thousands of lives. And at the heart, I'll take you once the protect time is over, I think, uh, and at the heart of this uh, motion uh, and the heart of the conflict is the racist call to cleanse the land of Jews. Calls maintained by the Palestinian Arab leadership, Mahmoud Abbas, and his promise that not one single Israeli would remain in a Palestinian state. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> I didn't use, sir, what I said was that the Jewish people are an indigenous people. If you wish to take issue with that, we'll have to have a whole separate debate. But they, forgive me, sir, you've had your point. Uh, the question here is whether or not Jewish people have a right to self-determination like anyone else. No one is denying any other people's right to self-determination, certainly not in this debate. And yet the issue is taken with Jews. And Mahmoud Abbas's promise that not one single Israeli would remain in a Palestinian state. And that is the purpose of these continued attacks. Now, the proposition we've heard deaf to this reality, or they simply do not care. The Palestinians have been clear that any concession of land by Israel will lead to the ethnic cleansing of Jews and will be used as a platform from which to continue to attack Israel. That is what Hamas and the Palestinian Authority continue to call for. I'm calling for a reality check, and that includes the appalling way that the Palestinian Arabs have been treated by their own people by surrounding the Arab states that have kept them in refugee camps for generations, and by Hamas and the Palestinian Authority that subjugate, repress, and torture them in their own autonomy. Because despite what you've just heard from the proposition, the Palestinians do have self-government. No wonder polls of Palestinian Arabs consistently show that their preference is to live in the state of Israel, where Arabs, Arab citizens of Israel, enjoy, enjoy all of the freedoms, yes, sir, are the only democracy in the Middle East, don't they? Um, I, the, the, the poll numbers that you just brought up is for Arab citizens of Israel, which is not what this debate no. is about. No, forgive me. No, no, no. no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm sorry, you had your chance. You're, in, you're incorrect, sir. The poll numbers I'm talking about are of Arabs living outside of Israel who would rather live in the only democracy in the Middle East as free citizens than under the repressive, brutal regime I've... of the so-called moderates in the Palestinian Authority. I'm limited on time, sir. The reality of the situation is that Israel's withdrawal from the Gaza Strip 
enabled Hamas to establish an Iran-funded terror launch pad from which both Hamas and Palestinian and Islamic Jihad have launched tens of thousands of missiles onto Israeli communities, hundreds, over a hundred, forgive me, in the last few days alone. The reality is that following the Oslo Accords and the so-called uh, moderates in the Palestinian Authority, they incite nursery school children to become martyrs by killing Jews and they incentivize the killing of Jews through their pay for slay policy, which pays convicted terrorists stipends depending on the number of innocents they kill. Peace is not on offer in this equation. That is the reality which the prosecution seek to, lay, uh, to gloss over. It's important for me to lay down some law. And this is the second issue I want to touch on. Uh, in light of what has just been uh, presented to you, because anyone who values a rules-based international order should be troubled by the misrepresentation of international law and the attempt to mask political opinion as law. And that is what we have continued to hear tonight. And I take one example. The fundamental default rule of international law, which governs the formation of a state's borders at the moment of independence, is called uti possidetis juris. It dictates that a new state inherits as its international borders the boundaries of the pre-existing administrative unit. Now, the fundamental rule is universally applied. It was applied in South America, in Africa, in Asia, at the disintegration of the former communist federations. And it is applied to states emerging from mandates. Syria, Iraq, Jordan, it applies in the same way to Israel at its declaration of independence in 1948. Now, another fundamental rule or principle of international law is its equal application. You cannot have a general rule and an exemption for a country that you don't like very much or you have some political or ideological opposition to. That is not how any respectable, reasonable uh, legal system can operate. The equal application of this rule tells us that in 1948, Israel's border ran along the eastern boundary of the mandate. It included East Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, later called the West Bank. In 1948, in a war of annihilation that was waged on Israel, Jordan occupied that territory and ethnically cleansed it of its Jews. And in 1967, in another war of attempted annihilation waged on the Jewish state, Israel recovered that territory. Now let's consider a parallel example in international law, seeing as the proposition had brought the subject up. Ukraine's borders were formed under the rule of Uti Possidetis Juris. That is why there is international consensus that Russia has occupied Crimea from Ukraine. Now as Ukraine continues to push Russia back, if it were to recover Crimea, in the same way that Israel recovered the West Bank from Jordan in 1967, would anyone here really accuse Ukraine of occupying Crimea? Of course not. Why the double standard for the Jewish state? The fact is that there is no occupation under international law. That is a political term, a liable with no legal basis. Point of information. Likewise, the claim of illegal settlements a term which seeks to justify the ethnic cleansing of Jews by implying that they should be excluded from certain areas just because they are Jews, while Arab citizens of Israel enjoy every freedom in the Jewish state, not a single Jew. When I was working at the Supreme Court, my, the judges I was serving include an Arab justice, and we have members of Knesset uh, who serve, supposed to serve the Arab community, but they don't because they pull the line that the prosecution have already been uh, towing this evening instead of serving the interests of their constituents. You may laugh, ladies and gentlemen, it reveals only your ignorance. While Arab citizens of Israel enjoy those privileges, not a single Jew is permitted in Palestinian-controlled land because of the racist policy that it must be free from Jews, or a term which some scholars of modern European history may be familiar with in this audience, Judenrein. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's learn from history. Immediately after the Six-Day War, seeking peace with its neighbours, Israel sought to return the Sinai and the Golan Heights to Egypt and Syria, and the response was the Arab League's three no's of Khartoum. No peace with Israel, no recognition with Israel, of Israel, and no negotiations with Israel. 
But over time, some of Israel's neighbours came to accept the reality of its existence. And Israel has been willing and able to make peace where it had a serious partner. A peace treaty with Egypt in 1979, a peace treaty with Jordan in 1994, and of course the phenomenal achievement of the Abraham Accords. Normalisation agreements with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan and Morocco. Peace for peace. That's an idea. Now, of course, some in the Middle East have not given up the goal of annihilating Israel, and that hasn't changed for 75 years. And don't be deceived. Calls for a one-state solution or the so-called right of return are both synonymous with the destruction of the Jewish state. And these calls for surrender by Israel of more land uh, seek to achieve that same ultimate goal. You're out of time, sir, I'm afraid. Um, now, since the Oslo Accords and Israel's withdrawal from Gaza, Palestinians have autonomies in the West Bank and Gaza, and both have become enclaves for terror. Only a crazy person would expect a different outcome doing the same thing over and over again. And that is the true challenge here, ladies and gentlemen. To explain to generations of Israelis who have seen every concession lead to blood on the streets and every sign of weakness lead to waves of terror attacks, to explain to them that for some reason, next time would be different. Think about that when you think about pressuring uh, Israel. A vote for this motion is a vote for further enclaves of terror and for the ethnic cleansing of Jews. If you stand against further bloodshed, then you stand with the opposition.